I'm Jake. I'm Tom. We are Velocities in Music. On this podcast, Tom and I discuss a breadth of topics pertaining to modern music, including artist deep dives and monthly and annual new music wrap-ups. Before we get started with today's artist deep dive, you can help support Velocities in Music. Subscribe to Velocities in Music on your favorite podcasting device to automatically get our latest podcast episode sent to your device every time we release it. Also, Velocities in Music does not want your money. We also don't want to introduce ads into the podcast yet. Right now, all we want is for you to share Velocities in Music with family or friends whom you feel would benefit in joining in on the music discussion we try to create in every podcast episode. So, I just mentioned we're going to do an artist deep dive today. I love doing artist deep dives. Uh, more, I, I honestly, Tom, I love artist deep dives more than genre deep dives. I agree. Now, I feel like, and and that's because. That's solely because of the prep work a genre mm-hmm. deep dive takes. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty intense. I, I don't feel like I can get the quality of the listens in for a genre deep dive because we usually are, are like have to listen to at least thirty albums. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, then you're getting like one, maybe two listens in tops, and takes like two, three weeks to prepare for. Yeah. Whereas like an artist deep dive, especially if it's an artist like the artist we're going to do today. Uh, who I know already. Mm-hmm. I know their work, um, and, and and have a not like an extensive discography. You yeah, know? Have, right. have a very digestible. Discography. Right. It's, it, it'd be different if we were going to do like David Bowie's <laughs> right. discography, which would be like I, I I don't think we could do that in more that, than that in would, less than three. That would have to be like four episodes. Yeah, it yeah. would have to be. Yeah, let, let's uh, let's do that someday. <laughs> someday, but not in the next few months. No. Okay. Um. So, artist deep dive. Sunny Day Real Estate. Yeah, 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 we've we've actually had several requests uh, from from listeners to do an artist deep dive on Sunny Day Real Estate, which I find <laughs> I find interesting. So we've done we've done grunge, yeah, uh, a genre deep dive on grunge. We've done a genre deep dive on post rock. Yep. And and today we're going to do an artist deep dive on Sunny Day Real Estate. And the reason why I bring up those two genre deep dives, uh, one is to uh, playfully recommend our previous podcast for you who haven't heard them. And two, it is it is because I feel like Sunny Day Real Estate as a band kind of is like if I'm I'm big into Venn diagrams. If you drew a <laughs> bunch of Venn diagrams, one being grunge, one being uh, post rock, one being progressive rock, and then you put them kind of all together, that one little sweet spot in the middle, that's Sunny Day Real Estate. Mm -hmm. Now, Sunny Day Real Estate has become known as the definitive emo band. Yeah. What does that mean, Tom? As kind of the definitive emo band, I mean, obviously, Sunny Day Real Estate, we talk about being a very influential band. They influence a whole new wave of emo music in the through the late 90s and new early 2000s. Emo? Not not a new wave, a, a new wave oh, of emo, okay. lowercase, okay. lowercase new wave. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just to clarify, yeah. when we use other genre names as just general descriptors, then it gets confusing, right? So, Is uh, it glow-fi emo? <laughs> <laughs> now, that would be a little more specific. <laughs> So, but so we talk about them being a very influential band for that reason because their first album, Diary, which of course we're going to get into, came out in 1994, and uh, and that was a very defining album in this new movement of emo music. But of course, Sunny Day Real Estate doesn't come without their influence as well. Uh, you know, coming from like Rites of Spring, who a lot of people consider to be like the very first emo band. Obviously, we can you know we talk about genre lines and definitions a lot and how wishy-washy those are you know usually the 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 forefathers of a certain genre or movement in music don't deliberately try to do that it's just recognized in hindsight right and i think that's definitely the case here um but but diary then you think about coming out in the context of uh the height the peak of the grunge movement in the 90s as well which you mentioned jake and we've talked about on this podcast before uh you know a lot of people don't consider Sunny Day Real Estate to be a a grunge band, but at the same time, how much are they really an emo band? I I think that's that's tough to label. I think they have a defining emo album, but as a whole band, I think they're much greater than that. Absolutely, and my I I have just a distaste for very specific genre labeling. Yeah, you know, outside of like hip hop, pop, rock, 
to me, Sunny Day Real Estate is a rock band. Oh yeah, they have. They there's certainly like when I listen to Sunny Day Real Estate, I hear grunge influences, especially in the earlier two records. Yeah, I hear a lot of progressive influences. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, it's very clear to me that these guys have listened to Rush before. Yeah. It's very clear to me that they've listened to Yes before. It's very clear to me that they've listened to Led Zeppelin oh, many yeah. times. Mm-hmm. Um, but but that's just part of of like what influences what drives a band. I really hear a strong Smashing Pumpkins vibe. Sure, yeah. Certainly throughout throughout their discography. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that's in, in Jeremy Enoch's voice. Um, I think I, it's a yeah, little bit like sense. Billy Corgan at yeah, times. Because they, they both have kind of the more high-pitched and emotive, almost that there's like a desperation in the vocals, you know, and, and, and Billy Corgan had that as well. So, Tom, can you provide some history? Who, who are Sunny Day Real Estate? How did they settle on... Um, their their lineup. How did they settle on the band name? That sort of thing. Sure. Well, we'll start in the very you know the very beginning. First off, another connection to grunge. They're they're from Seattle. Oh yeah. I mean, so you know, Seattle band in the early to mid nineties. Of course, it's going to be associated with some level of of grunge music. Now, I I think these guys were doing something very different. Of course, did they than see what Nirvana, themselves? Soundgarden. Yeah. Did they see themselves as a grunge band? I really don't think so. I think they were just looking to make the kind of rock music they wanted to make once again, you know, maybe fitting in with that Seattle sound a little bit. Um, but I think that their their influences were, as you mentioned, more on the prog rock side than like the the sludgy or punk side. Right. Uh, that that's where they evolved from, and and so that's kind of how they they ended up. But they actually started. With more of a post-hardcore sound, as as Dan Horner, mm. who is the the kind of rhythm guitar. Well, I, I think he and Jeremy Jeremy Enoch, the the vocalist and guitarist, lead vocalist. That is, uh, they kind of trade off. I feel like on on lead guitar versus rhythm guitar duties. But uh, Dan was was actually originally the vocalist, and then Jeremy came along, and his voice I think they felt kind of fit the sound better. Uh, but Dan still does a lot of backup vocals, and Dan's vocals when you listen to what he provides on their albums is a, a little bit more in, in kind of the post-hardcore vein. He, he's a little bit more of a, a throatier kind of screamer, whereas Jeremy Enoch, the lead vocalist, as you mentioned, Jake, he has that high-pitched kind of sound. He, he, there's a little bit more desperation, a, a, kind of a dryness around the edges to, to his voice. Mm-hmm. But, but to me, that's all about the presentation. You know, we, we talk about grunge. I, I think we have to come back to that and say, like, Really, what makes this emo and not grunge? Well, to me, it's it's the vocal presentation. If you had the writing 100% the same, only it was a, a Kurt Cobain or a Chris Cornell singing this, I think people would probably consider it to be a grunge album. Sure. Um, but because of the quality of Jeremy's voice, because it doesn't really fit with that kind of like barking, uh, growling, grunge, self-loathing kind of demeanor people don't really put it in that in that category but but really i think all of that conversation really only centers around their first album anyway because once you get beyond that i I think it's kind of a moot point so i talked about dan horner and jeremy enoch who are kind of the lead vocalists and guitar jeremy more on vocals dan kind of more on guitar of course but they help each other out. Uh, the other two members of the band of the original lineup were William Goldsmith on the drums and Nate Mendel on the bass. And it was that way for their first couple albums, which I think is where we're going to start. So let's move from there. Of course, well, there are some lineup changes and, and some things that happen within the band as we go on, but but that's what where the band started. Didn't they also go through several band names before settling on Sunny Day Real Estate? Yeah, that's true. And, and, and the name Sunny Day Real Estate, I think, has kind of an, an interesting... Um, has kind of an interesting story. It was actually partially inspired by a Talking Heads track. As as another great band oh, that yeah. we have to mention in every podcast. Radiohead. Radiohead. Yeah, it Head. wouldn't be a, a podcast if we didn't mention Radiohead. Yeah, that's somehow. how we tie it all together. That's our tie-in to, to this one yep. for a band that really has nothing to do with Radiohead. And then we'll never talk about them uh, right. again. <laughs> right. <laughs> People listening can't see me winking, but there it is. Uh, so... Sunny Day Real Estate, I think it's an interesting idea for for a band name because where it comes from is this concept of like in the future, 
everything will be able to be sold. And, and it's this concept of, of having like a real estate company that sells you sunny days. Like it's something that can be purchased rather than something that's controlled by the weather or, or God or some higher power, mother nature, whatever the hell label you want to put on it, uh, that that's something that would be able to be purchased and packaged and sold. So I, I think that's kind of kind of a neat idea uh, yeah, it's behind set, the band name. It, it sets it sets the, the disposition for the band that like that they're kind of just an angsty uh, kicking against the late stage capitalism yeah. of the modern world, right? Yeah, I, I think it's a really pretty spot on band name. Mm-hmm. Uh, in and while it's a longer band name, I think that it really works well for the band and their sound. Yeah, it's it's a strange phrase, but once you hear it a few times, you just don't even really think about it. It just kind of makes sense. Okay, Tom. So in 1994, Sunny Day Real Estate drops their first record, Diary. Yes. This is this is an interesting album. I want to start by talking about the album artwork. Mm-hmm. This this album artwork is very iconic. You have you have the little people, yeah, that without arms that you know, like in the the, the toys, yeah the, yeah, the little toy people from like I I remember playing with toys like that as a kid. Oh like yeah, in for like sure. The late eighties and early nineties, like mm-hmm. those, those toys of people without arms, the creepy expressions on their faces. But they're like, <laughs> it's like a pastel painting, and they're kind of like in this kitchen, and like one, the dad is dressed up, and the kids are there, and it's it's it somehow is just very critical of like modern life and yeah, modern it, society. It's kind of like a satirical yeah. snapshot because you have like the smoke pouring out of the toaster, right? But you still have all the little people's like static, like smile, like forced faces, you know. Oh man, like it's it's almost kind of unsettling. Yeah, and so coupling that with the title of Diary, and then you know from the moment that you put on the first track, Seven, you you are you are greeted with and just an absolute onslaught of of just distorted guitars, booming bass lines, spastic progressive drums, and then of course Jeremy Egging's uh, I- iconic vocals. Mm-hmm. So right away from the beginning of the album, as you mentioned, Jake, you 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 get a sense of what their style is. You have this dueling guitar, just just craziness. You have the drums, who William Goldsmith on the drums is just going nuts, uh, and and this is something that I think harkens more to their prog side. You mentioned bands like Rush and Yes, mm-hmm. and and you hear that in the technicality. You don't necessarily hear that in the style. But you definitely hear it in the instrumental technicality. And I think that that's where Diary is such a, a landmark album and why they're so remembered is, is I mean, not only is the songwriting great on this album, but I think it's remembered more for its style than anything. Uh, what they were doing with their instrumentals and the way that the vocals paired with them in 1994 was really, you know, quite a far cry from what we heard a lot of popular rock doing. Bands like Soundgarden and Nirvana and, and Pearl Jam and Smashing mm-hmm. Pumpkins. I mean, yeah, the, those bands had some of those aspects. Soundgarden was certainly a very technical band, but I don't. Th- I think that a lot of bands of the time either went for the more technical side or the more raw energy side. Sure. You know, we saw Soundgarden going for more of a technical side on Super Unknown. We saw, you know, uh, Nirvana going for a more raw energy s- sound on, on albums like Nevermind and In Utero. Uh, and, and Pearl I feel, Jam with 10. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I feel like... Sunny Day Real Estate were really able to capture both of them somehow. Yeah. But they're also one of those bands that I think make their songs, they're able to present them in a way that makes them sound simpler than they actually are. If you actually watch a video of these guys playing, um, for example, there's a great video out there of them playing Seven, the opening track from Diary on uh, John Stewart in 1994. Mm-hmm. And man, like you get a, you get such a sense of of how complex the song is from watching them play so much more than from listening to it and i think that's partially just because of energy that comes out in it in a more synergized live performance but it also has to do with the production every every song on diary specifically i mean you can see it in that john stewart video of of them playing seven but like every song on diary these guys are working as as hard as they can it's it's a strenuous mm-hmm. pace that they just wail away at their instruments they're like the the guitarists are just thrashing and moving their hands all up and down the fretboard the drummer is just spastically drumming as fast as he can all sorts of very complex fills and Mm -hmm. cymbal crashes the bassist is all over the place Mm -hmm. and jeremy enix vocals of course are are very 
um, just emphatic and and um, he the the way and I'm going to get into more of this later as we wrap up the first two albums, but but the way that he is able to go between the heavier um, belting out and kind of scream vocals that he has and just the softer, more melodic parts. I, I, the the energy that is presented, you you put it really well there, Tom. Like they they have a way of mixing that that just dynamic rock energy with complex instrumentation and technicality, and and that is something that is so unique to this band. And throughout Diary, uh, they they display this. Really, the first three tracks on this record, I think, do a great job of displaying those qualities. Seven in circles, and then uh, Song About an Angel, which is one of my favorite tracks on this record. Song about an angel is uh, a little over six minutes long, which which you know bands, um, the grunge bands. I don't I I, I don't remember uh, perfectly, but I I don't remember a lot of six minute grunge songs. No, no, not usually they're often. around like four minutes, right? And, and that's something on this album you'll notice too is there's really only one song that's under three minutes, or actually under four minutes even, and that's uh, that's track seven, Fuerton Squerto. If that's how you pronounce it, Fjorton uh, Squerto. That's how I'd say it. Yeah, and and that's that's a different kind of track. It, it feels more like an interlude. But but these guys, their tracks are sprawling. And you know, Jake, you mentioned song about an angel uh, as being a little over six minutes. Like kind of, I think the longest song on this album. And when you look at the song structure, it's really just kind of verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Except those choruses are so Mm multi-layered. There's so many different pieces to them that even though it's got a very straightforward, maybe kind of A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D structure, it still, it goes so many places that you don't really notice how relatively simple the structure is. Another way they do this, and they do this throughout this album, is the high dynamic contrast. Right. They have the very quiet verses, and then they have the explosive choruses. They do that throughout... It helps. It helps make those song structures, even if they are simpler at times, um, feel a little bit more dynamic. But then also, it really highlights Jeremy's vocals mm-hmm. because he can do the kind of quiet, like moody, uh, uh, yearning really well. And then it just busts into these desperate yelps yep. that are just so powerful and so uh, so emotional. And they and they do that in a lot of the verses too, where they'll have just that very melodic part, then pop into a quick screaming line, yep. and then pop back down. And and because of that, you're you're constantly like your brain is just constantly thrown off. You don't know exactly what you're hearing, but like if you abstract the structure, like you said, it's yeah. it's actually fairly simple at a high level. But uh, they're able to move through all these different fluid parts, like progressive rock does. Yeah. Um. You know, a lot of the great progressive rock bands are able to take a relatively simple structure and make it more sprawling and moving, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's that's one thing that these guys really do bring from the ta- bring to the table, uh, right from their first album. These guys, these guys were writing like it was their third or fourth album on their first yeah. record, which I think is part of what makes Diary special. After song about an angel, you have tracks like Round 47, and then, Tom, I know you love The Blankets, Where the Stairs. Yeah, that song is so intense, and uh, and the chorus, you just, I mean, you can't understand what the hell he's saying the entire song. You really can't, which you, you kind of can't on most of the entire album of Diary. Uh, the, the lyrics kind of get lost um, behind, you know, Jeremy's odd phrasing and on odd mel- melodic composition Mm -hmm. uh so it's hard to tell what he's saying but i love in the blankets where the stairs when it gets to the chorus and it just sounds like this just frantic yelping and and it i just love it because it just brings so much intensity to the track Yeah, there's several moments on this album, one in Song About an Angel for sure, The Blankets Were the Stairs, and the closing track sometimes, where I really think uh, Jeremy Enoch's vocals remind me of of Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. Mm-hmm. Um, just just that the way he's able to scream in kind of a high pitch, shrill scream. Yeah. So track seven, Fleur Ton Square Toe, that 
piano kind of yeah. you have Jeremy Enix Jeremy Enix vocals there um and that that kind of like minor key bar piano yeah. uh, interlude yeah uh, it's it's an interesting track and you know while it's probably not going to be anyone's favorite track on the album i think it's one of the most important tracks on the absolutely. album because it it breaks the flow a little bit and especially then leading into the intro of track 8 shadows right. um the, it's so important to bring it down there for a second and, and i think that they really just needed variety i I think that uh, this album is as goddamn good as it can be for the style that it is for what it is and but at the same time uh, you know it needed some variety in there because a lot of the tracks have a very similar approach and and uh, i think that that track does a really good job of that So it's interesting to me because they put that track as track seven. Um, now, and, and maybe I'm I'm missing something here because in the mid '90s, I mean, like CDs were just becoming a thing, and I was you know seven in 1994. So I don't I don't really remember um, like how that how popular records were at the time. Mm-hmm. I think that that was like from what I know, that was kind of like where the transition point had really happened. Like cassettes were really big, right. CDs were starting to come onto the scene, but but I didn't I don't really understand um myself how artists were designing splitting their records. It used to be, you know, back in like the 70s and 80s, uh bands would like try to split their record like kind of halfway. Yeah. Um when when you did something like this, um but but here, you know, about two thirds through the album you're splitting the record. Mm-hmm. And and the last four tracks on the on the record, Shadows, Forty Eight, Grendel, and then the closing track, Sometimes, um, they're simpler in structure. Yeah. And so while what why I have I have to give these guys credit because they knew that they had to separate um, and give the album some some variety. So they brought it down, mm-hmm. brought it into a, a kind of a, brought in a whole different instrument, whole different sound. It's a very stark contrast from everything that you've just heard. But they also recognized that the simpler tracks were going to be put at the end, where the more progressive mm-hmm. and loud, more distorted, more shrill sounding tracks are in are in the front two thirds. It's a very interesting album structuring move that I I think gets overlooked at times. Um, track eight shadows, one of my favorite tracks on this record. Um, more of more of a ballad for these guys. Still yeah. ro- still rocks out, but it's a very simple verse chorus verse chorus track that really works because of the dynamic contrast that they present, and because they've done all this progressive stuff that just is kind of all over the place on the first two thirds of the album. And f- here's the first real song on the last third of the record, and it's and it's surprisingly simple, and it's more focused on Jeremy Enoch's vocal delivery um, to carry a lot of that intensity that becomes a strategy that these guys will build on later in their career um, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit here I also have to note that I really like the last track, Sometimes. I feel like Jeremy Enoch's vocal performance in in that track is so desperate sounding mm-hmm. and and gripping that that he totally sells it. And that that song is I think it's in it's in three has kind of a waltz feel to it. Yeah, it's it's much slower in tempo, um, and so like you hear these you know Jer- Jeremy's like singing out and and how he sings out like the notes just kind of hang on, and so you hear the, the like the tear in his voice, um, and and how that that gets conveyed over this like terrible production that you hear it through <laughs> is is really is really intense um and just a just a nice way to wrap up the album because there's still a lot of sheer intensity there but it's it's not because the all of the instrumentation is just going crazy like you've heard on many of the other tracks on this album So we've talked a lot about how intense and and complex the instrumentation is mm-hmm. on this album, but to me, one of the biggest things that holds Diary back from being a perfect record. Okay, mm-hmm. I love this record. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I just don't think it's a perfect record. I think that one of the main reasons why it's not a perfect record is because of the production. Yeah, I can see that. And and 
and maybe this is done purposefully, and maybe it's because this is the band's first album. They didn't have the right equipment or whatnot. Um, but but the production is just awful on this on this record. The guitars, <laughs> well, I mean, like the the thing you have to consider about the guitars is usually you have this combination of the squealy lead guitar and the distorted rhythm guitar, but they're switching mm-hmm. back and forth between like the lead part all yes. the time. Yes, they are. Which which I think is uh, I love it when bands do that. Um, but it's so hard to, to discern as the listener to discern what's happening. You have to listen very, very careful because it carefully because it all sounds so flat in the mix, yeah. right? Um, everything is muddled. Everything is buried. The drums sound god awful on this record, and, and and it does the drummer a disservice. Yeah, it, it really does because he's he's freaking excellent in mm-hmm. his his fills and his his cymbal crashes. The drum work that he's doing is is very very complex and serves the songs very well on this record but it it just like the snare sound oh my god you might as well like take a jar of urine fart inside it and then smack a stick on the side that's what it sounds like it's the worst sounding thing i really don't like the way that the snare sounds i'm getting there and and throughout this record like the production bothers me yeah. Um, there, there's not a lot I have to say that's negative about this record. I mean, I, I have, I certainly have songs that, that I like more than others, but that's not at, not because they're, they're necessarily better. It's just that they stood out for certain reasons. Um, I also feel like this is Jeremy Enoch's best vocal performance of the four Sunday Day Real Estate albums. Um, and, and just the way that he, like his, his voice, there's so much depth to his voice when he sings like you you hear all the emotion you hear pain you hear suffering you hear longing you hear yeah. happiness at times um and and when he screams you you hear that that all those same things just presented in a different way you don't find vocalists who can do that very no, often no and and i think that that's really what makes this band special is jeremy enix vocals um and what sets them apart and i obviously plays into how they get classified as emo because so much emotion is captured sure. in his vocal presentation Sure. And, you know, I see where you're coming from with the production. It didn't bother me nearly as much as you, uh, but I, I, I can't disagree with you on that. I could see that being being kind of a it, it's, limiting factor. It, it's almost endearing at times, too, because it gives their album kind of like this this uh, shrill um, kind of garage feel to yeah. it. And, and it just makes it feel a little bit more juvenile. Mm-hmm. And I think that that, you know, that kind of uh, dirty sound is appealing. Um, it certainly is appealing as kind of like an idea i mean i think of japan droids um a new band uh, a more modern band that does kind of the same approach like they yeah, have a very point. dirty sound and it's what makes the band appealing a lot of bands are doing that nowadays and um you know but but on the other hand just like we have the vocal test if the vocals don't add value to the music don't have them there it, you have a production test test too like if your production style or lack thereof is hurting your music you need to change something and that's all i'm arguing is that i do think it kind of brings it down a little bit yeah that that makes perfect sense so moving on from diary we go to just the next year to get their follow-up sophomore album lp2 now before actually diving into the music on lp2 i want to i want to i want to take a kind of a reflective moment on diary The, the, the thing that's difficult to talk about with Sunny Day Real Estate is that really they're a band that over the course of their four albums, they didn't really repeat themselves much. They changed very drastically. And because of that and because of their influence, it's really hard to talk about them in a very linear fashion. You know, I feel like a lot of my general comments have to do with their discography as a whole. So we can save some of that for the end. But there's one thing that I want to say as that pertains to Diary, looking at it in hindsight now that we're just to the next year of 1995. Uh, And that's that we talk a lot about Sunny Day Real Estate being an influential band, Jake. We've talked about this for years. This actually came up as a joke back in our album reviewing days when we would we started reviewing all these rock albums that had these hints of emo. And like I, I think there was a while where I felt like like three out of every four albums we were reviewing, I was like, this kind of sounds like Sunny Day Real Estate. And it became this joke between Jake and I. Jake, I actually think like the apex of this was in the summer of 2011, you and I did a throwback review of Baroness's uh, Blue Record. If you remember that, and I got—I do not remember that. <laughs> Whatever. Are you serious? I am serious. I don't remember. Okay. That. <laughs> okay. Well, I promise it happened. Uh, so I got on all music, 
And I, I love allmusic.com. I love just kind of clicking through bands, yeah, seeing have, related artists and stuff. Very high quality written reviews. Right. And so I got I, I got on Baroness's all music page and under related artists, under their influences, Sunny Day Real Estate was one of the like three <laughs> bands listed. And I was like, they don't even sound anything like Sunny Day Real but, Estate. But they kind of do, but, don't they? But then, yeah, but then you think about it and it's like, well, maybe they kind of do. This happened the other day too. So after we, we interviewed Joe Vickers of Caspian um, and he was talking about their upcoming tour with the Appleseed cast, I got on the Appleseed cast on all music and guess who was listed under it? An influence. Sunny Day Real Estate. These guys have to be one of they're, the most influential bands of all time. They're everywhere. Yeah, it's totally true. But my point is, I think that it's more diary. I think it's more diary than it is their entire catalog. Because yeah. that, the sound that you hear in diary is the sound of theirs that you hear other bands adopting yes. and, and doing things with. Now we're getting into LP2. We'll be talking about how it feels to be something on their third record, The Rising Tide, their fourth and final LP. And those three albums, while, while we'll get to be talking about how much we like them, I don't actually think any very many bands out there listen to how it feels to be something on or The Rising Tide and said, yes, this is what I want to sound like, which I think is a damn shame. But when we talk about them being an influential band, and we think about them being an iconic emo band, I think what we're really saying is that Diary was an influential album and that Diary is an iconic emo album. Because from there, while they go on to make what I would say is is vastly underappreciated great music, I don't think that that where we go from here is really where their inf- influential side is. Yeah, that's I, a fair I, point. I just don't think that's where it is. So... That being said, let's jump into LP2, 1995, so, just the next year. Yes, it's just the next year, but by the time this album was released, the band had broken up. <laughs> yes. What, how, how is that possible, Tom? T- tell us about the events that, that transpired in the year of Diary. Sure. After, so, so, you know, like, as, as music listeners, like, we get an album, but then we don't realize that after an album is dropped, like, the band goes through a, a kind of a metamorphosis, right? Yes. Every, every band does. They have to go on tour and support the music. They have all sorts of, of uh, you know, usually you have all sorts of, um, like, uh, publicity things that you have to do, of mm-hmm. which Sunny Day Real Estate tried to do absolutely none of. <laughs> right. They weren't really into that. Uh, They wanted it to be about the music. They wanted to stay more behind the scenes. There was also some friction happening in the band between late 1994 and through 1995. Uh, I think things just weren't clicking with them musically as well, but also Jeremy Enoch, the lead vocalist, uh, had kind of a a religious epiphany, uh, converted to Christianity. And while while the band claims that that didn't really have too much of an impact on things. Uh, it certainly indicates a personal change in, in who is the front man of the band. And I think that's going to, uh, you know, even if it's not explicitly going to to affect things, I, I think that, that it definitely is going to affect his mindset, his priorities, and, and the way it plays in the music. So my personal opinion on is is that that gets a little bit too much attention. I agree. I, that absolutely agree. had something to do. It, it needs to be mentioned, but you can't put all the weight but, on it. But also, like these these guys had pretty interesting personalities. Like for example, Horner refused to play a show, play shows in California, yeah. the state, like boycotting California. Which, when you live in Seattle, that's probably going to be where a lot of the opportunity yeah, is. Yeah, right. You just head down the West Coast, right? Right. And, um, in, they actually did end up playing a show in uh, in California, but Horner didn't didn't go, so they had to play as a three piece. Like the, like these guys are very interesting personalities. <laughs> yes. Sometimes you know, I, just little examples like that are are like what like they're obviously all very opinionated and very probably hard to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, and so naturally, and especially when you you know that angst in the music has to come from somewhere. Um, and a lot of times, you know, artists you know that that exhibit a lot of those qualities. It, it's kind of hard to work together. Yeah. And LP two. I like working with you, Tom. Right. Yeah. My my personality. You're you know, very angsty. I'm, I'm very angsty. You guys don't see it, but every now and then I just go and I just punch Jake. And he okay. and he screams. He goes Rah! <laughs> And he screams and punches me. And then we just we you know we keep going. We edit yeah. that out and then just start up again. Yeah. It's uh, it's very disruptive. I need to do something about it. Anyway. So. <laughs> so LP two, you can definitely tell, is the sound of a band falling apart somewhat and to that point they still came out with a pretty damn good album considering i will say up front i think this is probably their worst album 
of the four, but I almost think that's more a testament to how good the other three are than, than how than how bad or disappointing that's LP two is. Uh, at nine tracks, it's it's a bit shorter of an album, um, but you know we we talked about the band kind of breaking up throughout this. I think that this album would have come out sounding a lot closer and and uh, more as put together as Diary if they hadn't had been breaking up. You know, Jeremy has even said that him and Dan, when working on the lyrics, they just didn't even finish lyrics. For, for some of the tracks. They, he just kind of went in there and made some sounds and there weren't really lyrics associated with it because they just wanted to get the damn thing done. That's why the album cover ended up just pink and not having a name for the album because they were they were done. They checked out and uh, they just told the record company, I don't know, make the album pink. And so they did and threw the name Sunny Day Real Estate on it and it just got known as LP2 or the pink album. Like this this is obviously, this, the, this is a band that just doesn't care anymore. And because of that, the nine tracks on this album, they, they're good. Good. They're they got good instrumental parts, but they don't feel as fleshed out. They don't feel as as planned and deliberate as everything that you heard on Diary. But we also get a different kind of sound. I think that this album is smoother and a little bit more polished in sound. In fact, I think that the best way to summarize the difference between Diary and LP2, which which I would say these two albums probably sound more similar than any other two albums in their discography. Okay. This is this is probably the the least sound changing move that they make. But I think that that really how you can sum up the difference between these two albums is listen to both versions of the song Eight. Eight was was originally released and officially released as the sixth track on LP two, which is what we're talking about now. But if you go back and listen to the 2009 reissue of Diary, uh, the second to last track, the track after the first bonus track after Sometimes, is an early recording of eight that they did for the Diary sessions. They ended up not releasing it with that album, but then they re-recorded it for LP2. And the difference that you hear in these two different versions of this song. Uh, at first may seem superficial, but I think they're actually quite profound. The diary version sounds so much more frantic. And when you listen to Jeremy's vocals, he's rushing them the entire time. He's like a, a, like a half a beat ahead of where he needs to be in the vocals. Then you listen to the LP2 version and the performance is a little bit smoother, it's a little more ethereal, and everything just blends a little bit better. And that really actually encapsulates the, the main difference in this album, is that it is a little bit smoother. Uh, there, there's still a more emphasis on that low dynamic, I would say. There's still some explosive choruses and things, um, but they, they just, uh, I think they just weave everything together in a less biting and, and uh, a more tactful way. One of the things that I hear on this record is that they're they're going for a more complex sound from the start of the record. I think mm-hmm. that that you know, first of all, you know, it's nine tracks long. This is a their shortest effort. Um, you have you have three of the tracks that were written in the first album session. Yeah, that were re-recorded. Friday eight, as you mentioned, Tom, and the closing track, Rodeo Jones. Um, so, so the recording sessions here, you know, I, I complained about the production taking away from the sound on Diary. Well, the production is a little bit better uh, on on this record, but yet this this record really has kind of it. Like you can you can hear that unfinished vibe mm-hmm. throughout the record. You, there's there's little artifacts that let you know that this this record was just kind of hastily thrown together and released without the polish that it probably deserved. Mm-hmm. A lot of times you have, you know, different guitar parts that just don't line up and and they just kind of sound messy, like they hadn't actually worked out how to make it sound just right. Um, sometimes it gives it this this kind of strange dynamic effect um, that gives the, the music kind of this creepy vibe to it, but at other times it just sounds terrible and messy. Um, and sometimes within a certain track, uh, parts like the chorus might be really good, but the verses just sound kind of bland and messy yeah. and not really perfected. Um, and, and therefore... 
this album, I think, gives off like a, a strong sense of track displacement. I really like several tracks on this record. Um, the first two tracks, Friday, um, Theo B, uh, Theo B as as only a three minute long track feels a lot longer than three yeah. minutes. By the time you get to the end of that track, it is rocking out. Um, and, and probably one of the heaviest tracks in Sunny Day Real Estate's discography. Um, but then after that, you have a couple others, Red Elephant and Five Four. These are good examples of where, now I'm not saying that these are bad songs. Don't get me wrong. These are still very good songs, but there's parts where it sounds off. It sounds messy. Um, and there's other parts within those songs that sound really strong. Track five, Waffle, and then track six, the re-recorded version of eight, are very, very strong songs. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but I think like the last three tracks on this record are you, you hear a lot of that just expansiveness. That's not this unperfected um, yeah. expansiveness in their songwriting that that didn't really fully get finished and pulled off. I agree with that, particularly on the last two tracks. I actually am a big fan of track seven, Escarabade. Cool. That, that's one of my favorites on the album. But another thing I want to point out is that you kind of alluded to this, Jake, but the first four tracks are all under four minutes in length, which is something we pretty much didn't see on Diary. And right. I have to speculate, is that is that deliberate? Is that they were actually trying to be more tactful in their track length? Or is it just that they didn't have time to flesh these songs out as much as they would have liked because they were falling apart during the session? Sure. Uh, which you mentioned, you know, like Friday had kind of been written and then repurposed, so maybe not for that song. Um, but as a, as a two and a half minute opener, I think that song is one of the strongest statements on the album. Uh, so I gotta I gotta digress real quick, Jake, into a personal story. This is story time here. And this is really the story of how I got into Sunny Day Real Estate stems off of this album. So we're gonna take a trip back to the mid '90s, around the time this came out. I was I, five. Yes, you were five. I was. So actually, so let's take this like a, a year or so later. I think like 1996 or so when I was seven, um, and. I had a cassette tape. Back in the day of cassette tapes, I had the Batman Forever soundtrack. It was one of the first cassette tapes I owned. My family didn't have a CD player yet. It was basically me and my brother listening to the radio and hitting record when songs that came on that we liked were on, and we made our own little mixtapes. Fun times. Uh, and then we had a handful of like cassettes. I think we had like Collective Souls self-titled album. We had Metallica's Kill 'Em All. And we had the Batman Forever soundtrack. And the Batman Forever soundtrack for uh, overall wasn't a terrific soundtrack, but it had some highlights. It had like Nick Cave, PJ Harvey, mm-hmm. Offspring, um, some some pretty cool stuff, U2. Uh, and then one of the songs on there was Eight by Sunny Day Real Estate. That was my first exposure to this band, and and for that reason, Eight has remained one of my favorite Sunny Day Real Estate songs. But man, that song, you know, to to someone like me who was just listening to rock radio, that song just had this intensity to it and this attitude in the vocals that I never heard before, and I really gravitated towards it. It wasn't until years later that my brother started buying Sunny Day Real Estate CDs and, and I listened to him and I was like, holy crap, these guys are actually really good. I just remember that one song from the Batman Forever soundtrack. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if anyone else was, was digging that cassette back in the mid-90s, but, uh, but that's how I got into this band. And, and that song still, it, to me, is just a, a terrific, terrific track. Starts with this spooky kind of discordant guitar, very slow, and then just pummels you, just busts into this, this huge uh, instrumental climax. I just love it. Some thoughts on the songwriting changes that I hear on LP2. You, you, the guitars play a much bigger role. Uh, they're designed to be louder and more distorted. Like I said earlier, they're just slightly off, creating that that messy dissonance. Uh, the drums, I think, are there's a key evolution in the songwriting in in how the they approach the drums uh, on LP2. The drums are much less punk driven and you start to hear the drums kind of shaping and guiding the songs more they're more complementary to the more progressive uh side of of their songwriting and that is absolutely key 
uh, from a key difference between Diary and some of their later records. So I really heard uh, these guys evolve in in that respect. And and overall, I think this album is much quieter um, yeah. than than Diary was. Diary was you know not afraid to just crank it up to eleven almost at random at times. Mm-hmm. Whereas this album is just just kind of more brooding and quiet but then when it does get loud it's much more stark um so that contrast and that dynamic contrast is is so vivid that that you know i i think that that almost uh brings out some of that messier unfinished uh sheen that you hear in this record and and it just kind of makes it more of a, a frustrating listen so moving on from there 1995 the band for all practical purposes break up Nate Mendel, the bass player, and William Goldsmith, the drummer, actually go on to join Foo Fighters with Dave Grohl as as Nirvana had ended and Dave had released the uh, debut album by Foo Fighters, which was pretty much just all Dave Grohl. Uh, so so William and Nate joined him in, in doing some, some shows with Foo Fighters and starting to record their next album. Through that, uh, William actually decides to leave and go back to Sunny Day Real Estate and Nate stays with the Foo Fighters. So now we're we're down a member from the original lineup. We've got William, Dan, and Jeremy, uh, but Nate is off playing with the Foo Fighters. So they there's some time off in between there. Uh, and in 1996, Jeremy Enoch releases his first solo album, Return of the Frog Queen, which you listen to and it sounds nothing like Sunny Day Real Estate. Now, we're not going to get into Jeremy's entire solo catalog. Uh, He has some other albums in the 2000s that came out. Uh, We're not going to get into those. But why I think that this particular record is very important, uh, it's a a short record, just under 30 minutes, but the sound is so different. It's a very artsy kind of indie rock album. And it sounds nothing like the the intense rock that we know from the first two Sunny Day Real Estate LPs. Well, the reason I think this is important is is thinking of it from a solo artist perspective. It makes sense that that Jeremy recording as a solo artist would have this more diverse sound. I, I know from experience when you're recording as a solo artist and you're not thinking about the band format, it opens you up a little bit to bringing in other kinds of instrumentation and, and putting these flourishes into the song that might not work in like a rock quartet context. So you hear that a lot on that album. And then a couple of years later in 1998, you know, they, they reform Sunny Day Real Estate as as uh, as Jeremy, Dan, and William, and they get some other uh, you know another bass player to play bass on the their third album, how it feels to be something on. Another reason that Jeremy's solo work is so important here is because there are actually a couple tracks on this album that were meant to be for Jeremy's next solo album. He was writing songs from a solo perspective, but now all of a sudden his band's back together, and he's like, well, I guess I'll make these songs for the band. But this album is completely different from anything that we heard from them in the past. Just a completely different kind of rock sound. Yes, Tom, totally agree. This is a whole different caliber of record. First of all, first thing I notice listening, if you listen in order, the production is significantly stronger and more mm-hmm. appropriate uh, for for this sound, in my opinion. The mixing, uh, the, the, the higher quality of the mixing, the more detail... Um, in the mixing really only helps the instrumentation on this record shine. Also, Enix vocals are understandable on this record. His vocal parts are just simpler in presentation, yet they provide this huge amount of melody. I also think that you have the, one of the first things you notice is this is a much more blatantly progressive oh, yeah. song style. You you it's much darker in mood. Any vestiges of punk are sparse. And there's just a bigger focus on fluid dynamic shifts, whereas in Diary and a little bit on LP2 as well, you, it was more about the stark contrast between between the very loud and the very quiet. And here you have more moving, sweeping uh, dynamic shifts. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that, that pulls from that prog side a lot. You hear more of the rush, yes, even Genesis influence on this album uh, and and also what you hear is you hear this kind of like eastern mysticism creep into into the album now for a band that as i mentioned was was like an iconic emo band th- there's not really much emo about this album it it's a very hard album to define it feels like a combination of prog rock with the the 
indie rock of the 90s. You mm-hmm. know, you you have these, uh, you know, songs like Roses and Water, which is in nine, uh, and that has this this kind of, you know, I feel very much like a, a Russian Yes influence blatantly. And then you go to like Two Promises, which has this chorus that sounds like a, a classic, like guided by voices, 90s indie rock sound. And they blend these together seamlessly. And like th- this album, I got to just gush for a second. I don't understand why this is not heralded as an absolute masterpiece. And I've said it before, and I'll probably continue to say it, like, this to me is on, like, Nirvana's Nevermind Soundgarden Super Unknown level brilliance. I think that this is a very unique work. I've never heard an album like this, and it. I think the songwriting is just consistently top-notch. I, I, I don't understand. I would understand. say this is the most underappreciated record of the 1990s. I I would agree with that, probably. I, I can't think of a better candidate, really. I, I think this is just goddamn perfect. Uh, one thing I want to point out, too, that they're doing here is they're, they're making this album flow so much better than their last two. Well, mostly because there's a lot more dynamics to make flow. You know, we said, we mentioned Diary is a very cohesive album, and it is, but it's mostly because the tracks kind of sounded more or less the same. Yeah. Uh, LP2 was a little bit of a mess, but it was still pretty good. This is like the perfect cross-section because there's a variety in the tracks, but they still made it flow seamlessly. And I actually realized something about this album I think helps to do that, and that's the variety in time signatures. So I'm, I'm really going to geek out. I'm going off the deep end here, guys. This is, this is going to be... you got to bear with me here. So, of the first four tracks... Pillars, Roses, and Water, Every Shining Time You Arrive, and Two Promises. All of those are in 4-4 time, except for Roses and Water, which is in 9. So it has this more kind of, well, you know, it's a derivation of 3. We could say they're either in 3 or in 4 to some degree. So Roses and Water is the one that kind of stands out from that. Then you get to 100 Million, track 5, which is like this pivoting point in the album. 100 Million has, I mentioned the track from Diary Song about an angel, which is like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, but those choruses are are multi-layered, right? They're still doing that in the song structure here. And 100 Million is another example of that. It's actually a, a decently long track, a little over five and a half minutes, but it's mainly just two verses and two choruses. But the verses are in four and the choruses are in three. So you have two promises flowing into the from 4-4 four, four into the 4-4 four, four verse of 100 million, but 100 million ends on the, the three or six chorus and then goes into the title track, How It Feels to Be Something On, which is also in three. Think about how they're making that flow. That is so brilliantly designed. And then the last four tracks somewhat mirror the structure of the first four. And that the of those last four... The Prophet, track seven, is the only track that is in four, and then the last three tracks are all in three. So we have a lot of this album that's in three, three, four, or, or six, eight, you know, or in Roses and Water, kind of a nine, eight time signature, and that's what also helps give it that kind of like mystical quality. You also have Jeremy's lyrics, which are dealing a lot more with existentialism and these kind of uh, spiritual concepts, and that plays into the, the whole sound and the chord structures that they're using as well. Uh, I got to get back real quick also to the song structures themselves, which are brilliant. Uh, in songs like Pillars and Two Promises, th- these guys are like the kings of the drop chorus. The drop chorus is something that we talk about a lot, where, where you have a verse kind of flowing into maybe a pre-chorus, but then instead of busting into the actual chorus, you go back to a verse, right? They do this all the time here. On Pillars in particular, they actually build, there's three choruses and they build it each time. They add a section to the chorus that wasn't in the previous one and they do that three freaking times. Like, like they are thinking so hard about the way that they're structuring these and it's just, it's a, it's a song craft that you just don't really hear anymore. And especially in 1998, I mean, what else really sounded like this? That's a great, great rant, Tom, and I got to applaud you for a, a kind of a subtle way of walking through the track listing there. Um, two two of the tracks that you mentioned, track three, Every Shining Time You Arrive, and then the title track, How It Feels to Be Something on track six. I 
think are are both brilliant tracks. They're both mm-hmm. a little around four minutes long, give or take ten seconds or so. Um, and they're both they, like in my mind, these both kind of serve as dynamic ballads uh, yeah. for the record. Even though I wouldn't actually think that they fit the bill for a ballad, but uh, y- you get what I mean. They're a little bit softer, a little bit slower in tempo, mm-hmm. um, and more focused on kind of an emotive idea. Uh, but as as the songs progress, they build. Um, and by the end of it, you're still having that ballad and emotional context that you started with on the songs, but the song has taken you on a journey. Uh, and, and, and towards the end, you're reaching this dynamic co- uh, a climax where you're really hearing Jeremy uh, Enoch emote and, and kind of belt out, but it's much more controlled than, than on the previous two albums. So you, you, you see their growth as, as songwriters. I mean, they started off, you know, in their first record, Diary, you're thinking, wow, this is like... Normally, bands aren't that good at writing songs on their first record. <laughs> right. So, of course, you know, they started higher on the Y axis and then just kind of went up from there. But then, you know, in, in my mind, like these, like a lot of these songs are the examples of perfect songwriting from oh, yeah. some of the complex structuring that they were doing, as Tom mentioned, to just some of the magnificently composed instrumentation on this record. And then just the design of the sound and the per- perfection of the production. It, it's such a stark contrast from some of the messiness that you heard on LP2 as the band had just given up um, and then now reforming as a three-piece and then representing their ideas in a much more polished, focused form. This is the first time the band actually tried. It's like they they took themselves aside and said, okay, we're going to really try to make an excellent record and man, did they ever pull it off. Yeah, I I can't say enough good things about this album. Um, There are a lot of track highlights too. I only mentioned briefly the, the track The Prophet, um, which is one of the longer songs on the album, a little over five minutes. Uh, but it starts with this kind of like mantra-like chant and then just grows into this big, you know, drum roll type thing, a nice climax at the end. That one is is one that really well eschews the, the typical song structure. And then the, the closing track in particular, I have to highlight, Days Were Golden. This song gives me chills. It's one of my favorite Sunny Day Real Estate songs. And it's, it's a little bit more of a sedated track compared to the rest of the album. Uh, but the way it caps things off, it, it's one of those songs that really makes you think. And I think it leaves you in a way that, that allows this album to have an impact on you beyond just your listening experience with it. That's, that's really what, what caps it off for me. I have to say, I th- I really do think that every track on this album is is perfect. It really, like, I, really I, is. I look at this track list and I tried to pick like one of my favorite tracks from how it feels. Every single one I love. Yeah. Like I, on the back on the last four tracks, I picked uh, as a highlight the Shark's Own Private Fuck track mm-hmm. nine. Um, but but like I love Days Days Were Golden. I think guitar and video games. The the last three tracks, guitar and video games. The shark's own private fuck, which that song introduces strings, yeah, um, which is which is a really interesting and the take. The chorus, and, they sound great. Yeah it, yeah, it adds a whole different dynamic to it. And then closing with Days Were Golden, I think that those three tracks, I mean, are just the perfect way to close this record that really has taken you on uh, quite a journey through through rock music um, from beginning to end, from the hard hitting pillars at the very beginning of the record to the soft ending of Days Were Golden track 10. This is a masterpiece of a record. I mean, I can I can listen to this thing over and over again, and I, I don't feel it really has many equals. I totally agree. So then. We're moving on to 1999. We're going to stop in 1999 briefly and just mention that Sunny Day Real Estate put out a live album. 
which frankly I feel like is not really a terrific live album. Uh, I'm not really a big fan of live albums to begin with. I'd, I'd re- typically rather listen to studio albums unless the live album has something unique to offer, like Nirvana's Unplugged. Have, have uh, you ever, yeah, that's a good point. But have you ever noticed that like certain bands, either their best album is their live album, and their studio albums are kind of meh? That's true. Like or, Cheap Trick? <laughs> or, right. Or, or uh, Almond Brothers came to mind. Oh, Even yeah, though they, they have a couple very great albums, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Uh, but but otherwise, it's the other way around. I'm going to bring up Radiohead again just because I can. You know, Radiohead's yeah. live album isn't nearly as good as you think it would be. Sunday Day Real Estate's <laughs> live album isn't right. really right. N- nearly as good as you think it would be. Yeah, the, the only thing I want to mention about the live album, you know, they perform all right. I don't really like the production or the mixing on it, but it's 11 tracks. Six of them are from How It Feels to Be Something On. Then you have three tracks from Diary and two songs from LP2, which the two tracks from LP2 that they play are the closing two tracks. Tracks, Jaina, if that's how you pronounce it, I don't know, and Rodeo Jones, which I don't think are two of the stronger tracks. But in particular, what kind of is cool about the live album that I would highlight are the tracks they play from Diary. In particular, The Blankets Were the Stairs and Song About an Angel, where the the vocals kind of get lost on the studio version. You can hear the lyrics and the melody a lot more clearly on the live version because in 1999, having just come off How It Feels to Be Something On, Jeremy was singing a little in a, bit, a little bit more defined way. He was enunciating more clearly. The vocals weren't obscured in the mix since it was a live album. So that's kind of an interesting interpretation to hear. But honestly, I don't think there's really much more to say about this. It, it's one of those I think they just put out to please the fans and to uh, you know keep the band momentum going because you know for a band that had broken up just a few years before, now they put out an album which you know in my opinion is kind of the the highlight of their career and they put out a live album and now we go to 2000 where we have the rising tide which in retrospect now we know is is at least as of 2016 i can keep my fingers crossed but as of 2016 is their final full-length record okay so we did an album review of the rising tide towards the end of our video Mm -hmm. album reviews and and tom you and i both really like this record um but it's not perfect Right to start with, it's not how you how it feels to be something on part two. Um, the 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 thing that I have to mention with this album is that it is incredibly front heavy. The if you only listen to the front half, like if it, I, I imagine in two thousand, I'm a huge Sunny Day Real Estate fan, and I get the Rising Tide in the mail because I ordered it, and I'm going to put it on my record player, and I'm going to listen to it, and I'm just uh, like I have twenty how it feels to be something on T-shirts, and I've listened to that record <laughs> five times a day for the last two years. I get the Rising Tide, I put the record on, and then I listen to Killed by an Angel, the first track, and it's just rocking out. Um, the lyrics are are you know very very um, impactful. Um, kind of tells tells a story. Uh, the voc- the vocals are just as shrill as ever. It it has that just it, it kind of reminds you of Pillars, the first track of how it yeah. feels to be something on. But then it goes into one, which is my favorite uh, Sunny Day Real Estate song. I think it is is like honestly an example of a perfect rock song. Um, and just just super emotive. It, it, huge guitars the guitar sound is just out of this world good just some of the best choruses i've ever heard um some of great dynamic shifts Then it goes into Rain Song. Tom, I know Rain Song is one of your favorite songs. Great kind of acoustic ballad type track. Uh, Once again, got some kind of dramatic strings in it, which we saw was a newer addition for them. A not so subtle nod to Led Zeppelin. Oh, yeah, yeah, not so subtle in the track name. Show me the evidence and the talking down your 
Uh, but I just find that song to be moving as hell. It's a it's a terrific one, and it helps break up. It, I think it's one of the things that helps make the front half of this album so great is that it helps break up these rock tracks. But really, that's what this album is. This is the most straightforward rock sounding album that they have but because these guys are just so damn good they don't let it bring them down they make the most of it and 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 for from my perspective the first tr- six tracks on this album are perfect yeah. i wouldn't i and, wouldn't change and, a thing and if you're if you're going through that as a first time listen and then then you start to hear some of the songs on the back half of the record which aren't bad songs don't get me wrong um but but tracks like um even even to some extent fool in the photograph although i do like that track but television which is probably one of the more poppy tracks on the record it's probably the most straightforward track um faces in disguise track 10 even even a little bit the closing track but i actually yeah. really like the closing track too um it, it's just it's just a different caliber of record this it, there's really two sides an a side and a b side to this record and it's kind of disappointing um, because because your your expectations are so high when you have such a cohesive listen like Diary is their first record record such a perfect listen and how it feels to be so, something on uh, in their third record and where they're gonna go from here it, it it's just like I feel like this is kind of a step down you you know what I really think brings this album down a little bit as well even in that first half which I already said I think is pretty much perfect is the bass. There's not as much bass presence here. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, we, 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 we mentioned that after LP2, Nate Mendel, the, the original uh, bass player, left the band. Uh, but for How It Feels to Be Something On, they, they brought someone else in. For Rising Tide, Jeremy Enoch just took the bass duties and he, you know, he, he didn't do a bad job, but it's more just you can 100% tell that the bass was an afterthought, Mm -hmm. that the bass was just there to supplement what they had already written with the guitars and the drums. And, and that's kind of a shame coming off of how it feels to be something on where like, God, right away from the opening track pillars, the bass is like, the key part of the sound like the bass owns that song and then the rising tide i can't think of a single real bass highlight uh so i think that is kind of a shame i i agree with you jake i think that fool in the photograph television and and to a lesser extent the the closing title track on rising tide aren't quite all that great tearing in my heart and faces in disguise are probably the highlights of the back half for me um and this is still a great album but but just yeah the 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 last handful of songs really have trouble living up to the first first part uh another thing i want to mention about rising tide is look at the track lengths we're back to all tracks over four minutes in length so they don't quite have the diversity in the track lengths either so you know that's that's not really a big knock against the album or anything i just think it's another thing that 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 limits the variety limits the dynamic level yeah after after one i really feel like they took a step back on the songwriting they the songs are just more simply composed. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned the bass part and that probably played a huge role in that, uh, that like, I, I just don't feel like they had just the creative process in the same, in the same vein that they did on previous mm-hmm. records. And, and it kind of comes out in the songwriting. This, a lot of these songs just don't hit quite the same way. Um, I think that you have some masterpieces here. Um, some, some of Sunny Day Real Estate's best work, um, really in the first four tracks of the album, but also some of their least impressive efforts in, in total, in, in, you know, summation of their total discography. Now that doesn't mean that they're bad songs. They just don't quite live up Mm -hmm. to, to the obscene expectations the band has set for themselves and their fans. But this is still an album I come back to a lot because... Not only does it not sound like anything else Sunny Day Real Estate did, I mean, their entire discography is pretty goddamn diverse, but it still doesn't sound like really anything else that any other rock band was doing or has done, especially in the year 2000. You know, this is now, now, you know, we talked about their first album being at the peak of the grunge movement. And now we're in the year 2000. Their last album kind of occurred right at the peak of like the new metal movement. People were listening to stuff like Linkin Park and Deftones and, and, and that kind of harder rock. The Rising Tide once again finds Sunny Day Real Estate, even though they've completely changed their sound, still on the fringe. Like they're, they're still on the outskirts of what would be considered popular rock. And yet this has to be one of the slickest produced, just good sounding rock albums of that era, and one of the better written rock albums of that era as well, and still, 
it gets overlooked. If this if this record came out today, it wouldn't surprise me. It would be like, wow, this no. is a really strong rock, rock right. album. The fact that they did this back in like the late '90s and 2000s um, with how it feels, and then the Rising Tide, and they made such professional sounding rock albums is actually a testament to just how it, it's crazy how different these two albums sound from a production standpoint than yeah. the first two. Um, and and the Rising Tide is is even better produced than how it feels to be something on. Yeah, it it, it absolutely is. It's also got a different kind of sound for that full rock sound. Absolutely. Um, and and it, it's just great. Now, today in 2016, I think listening back to their their four LPs, um, it, it's interesting because when you listen to Diary and LP two, they sound like a completely different band than when you listen to How It Feels to Be Something yeah. on the Rising Tide. And I could see why if you fell in love with with Sunny Day Real Estate from the beginning in 1994, where you might be a little put off by their last two albums. But listening in retrospect now in 2016, you almost have to think of them as like completely different bands. And, right. and you're probably going to lean towards one more than the other. But I feel like their last two LPs get really criminally overlooked because they they still have a lot to offer. They're still great albums. How would you rank the albums, Tom? For me, it is definitely how it feels to be something on at the top. Uh, and then LP2 is their worst. Rising Tide and Diary, I really struggle with. I put them on about the same level, but for very different reasons. Uh, I think that Rising Tide has has better highlights, but Diary is a better straight through album listen. And so for I, that I reason, with that. for that reason, I put Diary ahead of the Rising Tide. That makes e- sense. Even though a couple of my favorite Sunny Day Real Estate songs are on the Rising Tide. Mm-hmm. A, a couple of things we should mention also, uh, actually, is while this is the end of their LPs, it wasn't the end of their their releasing songs. In 2014, we saw them release the track "The Lipton Witch" as a split seven inch single with circa survive and that that's got to be one of their best songs like i i remember listening to that when it came out and i just listened to it on repeat i was like holy crap if they put out an album of songs this good today then they would they would still be showing that they're one of the best bands in rock music but unfortunately they didn't that was following a reunion in 2009 uh which from what i hear kind of fell apart once again they tried to record some tracks and lipton which was one of them and that's uh, that just uh, that uh, it brings a tearing in my heart. I see what you did there. <laughs> These guys really want to like each other. <laughs> yeah, and they it spend just time with happen. each other, and they realize they don't like each other. But they really want to like each other because they, I think, realize they make good music. Yeah, and like each other and respect each other. But then they get together and just, yeah, it's not going to work out. Yeah, not going to work out. I, yep. I made a list of my my top ten favorite Sunny Day Real Estate tracks. Uh, one certainly topped out that list, followed by Lipton Witch. I think Tom, your favorite track is Lipton Witch. Yeah, right? Lip- Lipton Witch, so, and then eight. So, so you really can't underestimate what this band can do because if in after you know fourteen years of of no new material, and then <laughs> they drop Lipton Witch. I mean, it, it just becomes something that that like I can't. I I desperately want them to release a new record. Oh my god, I would love that. Tom, what are some bands that you think that you know we're into in in you know the modern era, the 2016 sure. that that clearly pull a lot of influence from Sunday Day Real Estate? The first one that comes to my mind is Coheed and Cambria. Coheed and Cambria for sure. Uh, another one I would say is Circus Survive. I mentioned they they did the seven inch split with them. You can hear a big influence there. But anything that has any hint of emo or sometimes even pop punk or post hardcore, you know, at the drive in and then subsequently the Mars Volta, but particularly at the drive in, you you heard a lot of sunny day real estate in, um, as well as, uh, you know, more modern bands. There's that whole uh, other, I don't know if you'd call it like third wave emo movement. I'm not sure what what the 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 publicists and journalists are calling it these days uh, but you know Jake we've talked about uh uh bands recently like uh like pup and uh modern baseball and and stuff like that i i hear a lot of sunny day real estate in in 
albums like that, bands like that. Uh, I mean, these these guys are just all over the place. Right. We want to hear from you guys. What is your favorite Sunny Day real estate record? Do you like their early stuff or their later stuff more? Do you agree or disagree with Tom when we make the case that Sunny Day real estate's album, How It Feels to Be Something On, is the is criminally underrated and the most underrated album of the 1990s? We want to hear your thoughts so please give us comments on that. Also, if you guys want to hear our curated list of of the songs that you've heard Tom sample uh, in this in this podcast episode, and then our favorite Sunny Day Real Estate tracks, just go on Spotify and search for the playlist VIM Space Sunny Day Real Estate. It'll come up under Tom Hummer because he has the great last name. <laughs> Our next podcast will take us into early September when we reflect back on August new albums and our monthly wrap-up. Thank you guys for your continued support and participation. Tom and I love all of your comments on our YouTube videos, Facebook messages, and emails. Your participation is what makes Velocities and Music possible. So, as always, thank you for being awesome. I'm Jake. I'm Tom. We are Velocities and Music, moving music discussion forward. (laughs) 